really, I don't think any of us really grasp the full depth of what we have in it. I, I don't think we really get what it means like fully to be just in Him, to have Him living in us, to be His temple. I mean, we have the honor and privilege now of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit living in us. Moving in us. It says our spirits join with it. You know, I... I let's just give a round of applause for the Holy Spirit. Uh, 
it's really funny because I read it and I thought, like, here's what I read. For we know that the loss is spiritual, but I'm carnal, so I understand for what I'm doing, I do not understand what I will to do, that I do not do what I hate, that I do. If I then will not to do, I agree the law is good, but now it's no longer I who do it, then the sin that dwells in me. So I'm like, awesome! Went and bought a case of beer, because it's, it's not me, it's the sin that dwells in me, you know? <laughs> it's all good. And what is really funny is, I had a really twisted view of what grace was. And, and it's really funny, because I, I realized this is a huge problem, because there's a whole grace movement that doesn't really know what grace is. They, and there's a whole evangelical movement that's fighting against the grace movement that still don't know what it is. So, the problem is, a lot of people consider grace to be mercy. They, they think of grace as God has mercy on my sins. Well, if we're saved by mercy, then well, cool, there's not really much left to change. See, and one thing like, I've been realizing, if we confuse mercy with grace, we're going to confuse shame with humility. So the worse, the more we can be honest about our sin habits is the more humble we are. And because we're under mercy grace, it's cool. But oh, it's so not the case. The way, the way Jesus did it, he didn't just forgive your sins, but he gave you the Holy Spirit living inside you to empower you to overcome it. Yes. Come on, man. Come on. See, oh, there's... So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get more into that, but... So let's flash forward. I was on my testimony. Um, I got married. Uh, my beautiful wife over there holding my new baby. Woo! <laughs> and I kind of got burnt out in my faith because I got really intellectual, and like it, you know, and, and I didn't really get what a relationship with the Lord looked like. So I was passionate and kind of fizzled out, you know, and then. Uh, my wife's from Portland, so we moved from West Virginia to Portland about five years ago. And, well, longer than like six years ago, maybe. But, uh, yeah, so I moved here, and I was just real dry on my feet. So I took up video games and uh, just drinking more as my hobbies. <laughs> and I was like, and it was weird because I felt like convicted, so I had to do something religious at least, so I feel right with God. So I, I decided, you know, I, I'm going to start reading the Bible. So I opened the Bible, and it was really bizarre because I would intentionally, this is like one of the few times I've only intentionally tried to open the Old Testament. Because I opened the dreaded uh, Luke 21. In fact, I'll turn there, so. Luke 21, 34. But take heed yourself, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the cares of this life, that this day may come to you unexpectedly. <laughs> that is an awesome verse to read with a beer in it. <laughs> it's like <clears throat> instant conviction, you know? And, and it's funny because I, I learned the next morning, I remember I went through like a month or longer than that of this, where next morning I'm like, okay, you know, I, I want to be close to God, so I open it, and that verse again, every time I open the Bible, is at that verse. I try opening in Genesis, I'd be at that verse. <laughs> it was crazy. It was like, it was like supernatural. My Bible, like, only had one page. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, it was just, ah. And not only was I getting tired, caught up in the cares of this life, I was cluing out the cares of this life by adopting this imaginary life. I was worried about my game character's life, you know? I would actually wake up 4 o'clock in the morning just to level up, which is pretty pathetic. <laughs> but all of a sudden, like, it, I, I was listening to a song by uh, Sean McDonald, like, it, the, all I need is your love. He, he says this one phrase, he goes, I fall down in reverence, I fall down in fear, ask you, Lord, won't you please draw near? And I was like, reverence? Fear? What? What is that stuff? Mm -hmm. I actually prayed. I'm like, God, what, what, what does reverence 
look like. That's something I haven't really seen and I didn't really get for, you know? I had God living in me, but I didn't, never treated him as holy. I treated him as a common thing. So that's a scary place. Because the Old Testament, you have so a lot of examples of people treating God as a common thing. But luckily we're under mercy. <laughs> but, oh man. But it was crazy because all of a sudden God starts just challenging me. He's just like, what would it look like if everything you know about the Bible you lived out? And at this time, I'm used to debating atheists, so I know my Bible, you know? But it was just, living it was a different story. I didn't really think you could. Come on. I mean, that's kind of what we teach. You try to do the best you can, but you're always going to miss it. You're always, you're never going to reach this mark that we set. Come on. It's a good thing Jesus reached it and gave it to us. Yes. Come on. Come on. That's it. There's so much truth in that. So much power. But, yeah. Anyway, so God challenged me. He said, "What would it look like if you gave up everything? If you actually lived for me?" And then all of a sudden I started having, I had a dream where God showed me all my entertainment and stuff like this. And he said, what would it look like if you gave everything up for me? And I woke up after that dream and I'm like, you know what? I'm all in. God, I, I, I'm all in. And it's funny because when Jesus preached the gospel at the start, he preached all in. You know, in, in America, we have a habit of preaching the gospel and say this prayer, and one day you'll get to heaven. And it really doesn't do much for you in this life, and it, or we'll try to coax people like, hey, accept Jesus. He'll make your life better. He'll make, you know, he'll make you happy and give everything you want. <laughs> oh, the thing is, you got to deny yourself. It says if you delight yourself in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. And so, uh, was it 37 4? But to delight yourself in the Lord, it doesn't really leave room for you, like the old man. You can't really delight yourself in the Lord yet live for yourself. You actually have to deny yourself to do that. But when you deny yourself, God already knows the desires He put in your heart because He made you. So He just brings that. You delight yourself in Him and just give up everything and go so just wholeheartedly after Him, and He'll provide everything you are searching for away from Him. It's crazy. God, it's amazing. It says in uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 23, And he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. That's huge. We See, what I was trying to do was trying to save my life. I was trying to save a little piece of me, you know. I was trying to like, like, yeah, I have God, but I have my video games. I have God, but I have this much of this, you know. And it's a concept I see that's actually plaguing a lot of my brothers and sisters. So that's why I'm going after this thing tonight. Come on. Because you have the Holy Spirit in you. You're, you're automatically put by Him. Come on. He's in you. Come on. See. If you try to hold on to you, you're not going to make it. It's not good. Yeah. You're just going to get burnt out and dry and just wonder what happened. For what profit is it if a man gains the whole world and if he himself is destroyed or lost? For what is ashamed of me in my words of him, the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and his fathers and his, and his holy angels. That's a huge day. I do not want to approach that day knowing that I, I just follow God half-heartedly. See, there's the half-hearted Christians he calls lukewarm. They don't end up in a good place. Come on. Come on. Come on. But, see, Jesus, when he preached the gospel, he was really offensive because he made it all in right off the bat. He said, look, you deny yourself, you follow me. And it's amazing because it's, we weren't really created for ourselves. We weren't created to live for ourselves. We weren't created for that. So it's really just giving up something you were never created to be in the first place. You're created for Him. And in Him you are complete. That's what it says in Colossians. Come on. Which is crazy because before we know Christ, our spirit is dead. 
said, if one dies for all, then all die. Our spirit is basically dead. We have a spirit of a man who cannot receive the things of the spirit of God. Yep. See, there's, there's something crazy about being born again. It's really powerful. It is really, really good. See, we, when we're born, we're, we're born in just in sin. We're, we're born in just sinfulness. We have this nature thing. That's, that's the reason why we have to be born again. Uh, it's funny because uh, a couple weeks ago I was reading that and the Holy Spirit's like, hey, is there any such thing as a born again sin? Your spirit that's born again is not a sin. It's not. It's born of God. Come on. That's huge. And that's who you truly are. That's your real identity. It says you died and your life is hidden in Christ. That's huge. It says John chapter 3. So Jesus said, most surely I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. See, our problem is we're born of spirit, but we think we're born of flesh still. We're still thinking like the flesh. That's why it talks again and again. We need to renew our thinking to the work he did in us. See, we have the Holy Spirit. It's, it's, it's crazy. Like, like uh, in Luke chapter 1, like I was reading this, and it really surprised me because God just started speaking to my heart on it, saying that's how you were born. I want, I want you to go to Luke chapter 1, verse 35. It says, And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of high on or the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also the Holy One who is, who is to be born will be called the Son of God. It's crazy. The Holy Spirit overshadows you and He empowers you. And guess what? You're born again. You're brand new creation. Now you are a son of God. You're a child of God. Thank you, Jesus. You're born of the Spirit. It says in 1 Corinthians 6, 17 that our spirit, our, we are one spirit with the Lord. That's crazy. That's amazing. That's like in that connection, it's effortless. But there's the denying yourself part. You see, you're a brand new creation. You're born again. You, you are a new you're a new creation. It's crazy. Because uh, the number seven means spiritual, like, perfection or completion, right? Well, check this out. The number six means man, and the number one means God. So God, living in man, makes him complete. Makes him spiritually perfect. Come on. Come on. That's good stuff. But that's crazy. This world is waiting to see what a believer looks like. Come on. Yeah. I remember we were at the mall the other week, like, was it last week, I think? And there was uh, this guy and this girl sitting down and a friend, like, standing by them. And we walked up and like, hey, can we pray for you guys? We're just going around blessing people. And the guy looks at me and goes, you can pray. I got some. It's my birthday. <laughs> it's really funny because we, a lot of times we'll get offended. That stuff like that, like, well, you're not getting my blessing. <laughs> it's not your blessing, it's his, and he paid for that God on the cross. Come on. <laughs> so we gotta look at him through the lens of just what Jesus did for us. So I just said, look, how about I just bless you with just God's peace and his favor over you? They had to tell him shame on you for saying something, you know? <laughs> but it was cool because I, he let me pray, and I just prayed, and I saw business on him, saw prophesying on him, and he started looking at me really weird, like, yeah, that's true. And then I found out his knee was messed up. So I had the girl sitting there pray over his knee, all of a sudden his knee gets healed, and he's like really freaking out. <laughs> and, then, and the girl didn't want prayer at first, but then she saw that happen, so I'm uh, like, can I, just, can I just bless you too? She's like, yes, please. <laughs> so I just started praying over her, and the Holy Spirit just started unloading stuff about it. Just, it was amazing. She was just rocked, man. Um, she was just, um, I prayed for the Holy Spirit to give her a hug, and she felt arms wrap around her and give her a hug, and it was just like, cool, an invisible hug. <laughs> but then her friend ran away right when I started praying because she was not a believer. So she came back, and then her friend's like, yeah, his knee got healed. She's like, what? I'm like, you got any pain? She's like, yeah, I'm able. I'm watching this out. So I had the girl pray with me again to get her in the habit, you know. So, so I, I pray for her, all of a sudden her ankle gets healed, and then I start just prophesying about who she is. And I look at her, and I said, you don't know the Lord. I'm like, the, the God that just healed your ankle, do you want, do you want him to live in here? And she said, yes. 
oh, it was so good. She gave her life to the Lord, and then I got to explain to her, look, you just became a new creation. I was explaining to her how the blood of Jesus washed away everything wrong she's ever done. It doesn't exist anymore. He doesn't remember it anymore. It's gone. It's white. Come on. You now have access to God. You now have, you have the right to have a clear conscience before the Lord and to enter the Holy of Holies. And as I'm explaining that to her, the girl that I, I had there for Angel said, hey, can you pray that over me? She said, I've been living in sin, and I, I just, I, I need to be clear. So I just got to explain righteousness and holiness to her. It was just beautiful. I mean, if we, if we represent him well, God said Jesus is attractive. And he had multitudes following after him, and he hung out with sinners and tax collectors without being one. Come on. Come on. See, and it's crazy, because if you have the Holy Spirit inside you, Holy Spirit empowers you. That's what grace is. Come on. Come you see, the word grace is heart, which means the divine influence upon the heart that's expression throughout the life in the Greek, if you look up the uh, strongest definition. Which that's amazing. What it means is Holy Spirit sets up camp inside you and empowers your heart and changes your heart, gives you a new heart, and then it starts manifesting through your life. Come on. This isn't just about signs and miracles. That follows you. This is about living righteously, living as a believer. You're supposed to look like Jesus. You're supposed to represent His righteousness to this world. Ah, it's so good. But yeah. You know, with Romans 7, Paul, he's talking about what it's like to be under the law. You see, Without the Holy Spirit, without real grace empowering us to change, we try to do it in our own strength. So we set up this and set up this and set up this to try to help us. And then, hey, brother, can you hold me accountable so I can tell you every time I sin? And then every time I tell you I sin, it becomes humility. Hey, brother, I messed up again. It's okay. I'm glad you're being humble about it. <laughs> what about cutting that stuff off? What about putting me down? What about denying yourself? What about living for him? Come on. Yeah, come on. God. Mm -hmm. There's so much more. We don't grasp what we have. See, grace is that you were a sinner. You were separate from God. You had no chance and no hope. But he took everything you've ever done and everything that can separate you from him on himself. And not only that, he empowers you to walk in the righteousness. He purchased you. Come on. Grace empowers you to walk out truth. Come on. It's funny because if like in the context of the Bible, when it talks about grace, and, and uh, I believe it's Timothy, it says crack people with gentleness so it may uh, so they may have grace to change. Come on. Well, what's grace? Them being impacted to change. You see, see, Paul and Ephesians say, I have grace to minister to the Gentiles. What's grace? His ability to we just say, oh, it's unmerited favor. Yeah. It's mercy. And really we're thinking it's mercy. I'm under grace so I can sin all I want. Yeah. That's not grace. That's from the devil. That's yeah. 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 <laughs> but yeah. It's a good thing. Romans 8. Man. <laughs> There's therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. That's good stuff. You see, it says you have a choice. You can walk according to your flesh, or you can walk according to the Spirit. He gave you the Holy Spirit to empower you to walk out what He tells you to. That's grace. In that, there's no condemnation. It's good. It's not so good if you walk according to the flesh. That's why He says deny yourself. That's part of it. See, the flesh isn't this weird thing inside me that's like part of my heart that's really evil and wicked. <laughs> Because when we start thinking like that, Adam and Eve's response to that was hiding from God. So when we think we're like, have this duality going on, where I'm like, I'm good, but I'm part wicked. That's twisted, and that's not understanding who you are. You're born of God. That stuff just needs to cut off. That's a lie from the devil. Yes. There's probably a lot of people who would be offended at me saying that, but it's true. Because what the flesh is, it's your mindset your memory muscles, you have a whole life of thinking like the devil. Mm. See, when I came to the Lord, 
I was a drug addict. I was into all kinds of stuff, and I really boom. That was my mindset when I came into Christ. My mind wasn't renewed, so I still acted on the deeds of the flesh. Come on. It's kind of like saying there's this house, right? And there's a landlord, he rents this house out to this tenant, and this tenant's a crack addict and just like all kinds shoots the place up, burns the carpet, and just <laughs> just makes it garbage, right? And then all of a sudden the landlord comes over, he's like, no. They say, cool, get out. Out of the house. He gets evicted. He's gone. Well, check this out. He's gone, but the place is still left a mess. See, uh, that old man, he says he's dead. He died. Our lives are hidden in Christ completely. That's what Romans 6 is all about. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, we still think like the devil. We still think like the old man. We still think in, li in the mindset of the mess that sin made in our life. Come on. That's cool. That's why we get to renew our mind to this. And as we renew our mind to this, we become this and we want to live to the world. Come on. Good. Come on. It's really, really good. Yeah. Hallelujah. See, Jesus didn't give you a mission to fail. He gave you his spirit. So I'm not a Roman 7 man. I'm a Romans 8 man. Come on. It's good. But yeah. And it's, and it's, it mentions... Like Romans 8, it, it mentions that if we're led by the spirit of God, we we're sons of God. In verse 14, at first, many are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the Spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the Spirit of adoption, mm -hmm. by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Yeah. That's good. I'm a child of God. I'm no longer. <laughs> uh, it's just strange because I did a lot of messed up stuff in my life. And it's funny because the devil loves to pick that stuff, you know? He loves to remind you of past, remind you of this, remind you of that. And then I go to God about it. I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I, when I said I don't remember, I kind of meant that. He said he doesn't remember your sins anymore. He pays for it. It's gone. It's, it's under the blood of Jesus and the blood of Jesus. It's powerful enough to give you a clear conscience and you with a clear conscience before God will stop the devil everywhere you go. Come on. Come on. But you just got to get past the people. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, I want to turn out to Washington. I've been to like Colossians all week. Like this guy just been tripping. I love this book. Thank you. Verse twenty one. Uh, for chapter one, verse twenty one. And you were once alienated <coughs> and enemies in your mind. By wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death. He reconciled you in his body to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. He did that for you so you could become his holiness in this world, so you could put on a new man. See, that's good. See, we we're once. Just in the kingdom of darkness, we're once living for the devil. When we live for ourselves, we are living for the devil. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're once in that, but God had mercy on us, and God reconciled us, and then he has grace to give us power to walk out what he called us to. It's good. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Thank you. Now, Principles of the world where we think logically, we 
nine steps to righteousness when he was a one step program. Woo! Come on! He died for all on the cross. He died for you. He took it all yes. on himself and he lives in you and power. Yeah. Just relationship with him. He made it really easy. We're just suckers. We, we kind of like like to complicate things. It says, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead body, and you are complete in him who is the head over all principality and power. So if he's the head over all principality and power, and you're complete in him, that doesn't really leave <coughs> much room. Come on. See, yeah, I, mean, I, I agree. There's stuff that can pass on to the bloodline. There's stuff, there's bondage, there's stuff that switch bloodlines. This is a lot better. Come on. Say it again. Thank you, Jesus. Switch bloodlines. Yes. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. God's good. So a lot of people we come just come across, they don't see God as, as a father. They don't see God. It, it's crazy because religion kind of paints God as this angry God who's constantly waiting for you to mess up and, and he gives you assignment that you're bound to fail because your sin nature that lives inside you and it's really twisted and in that place you don't really trust God as good. You could say it with lips, but it's not in your heart. Come on. See that? But that's because you're you're deceived by the traditions of men. You don't really get what he's saying to you. He lives in you. Come on. Love you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. So good. There's a circumcision of the flesh. Yeah. It says in verse 11, Colossians 2, 11. And then you're also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism, in which you were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your trespasses and uncircumcised in your flesh, you made alive together with it, having forgiven all your trespasses and having wiped away the hand away the requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. So what he did was he took the whole entire law system out of the way. He said, look, love people, but he, he paid for everything. It's good. And the circumcision of your flesh is, you know, we come to the Lord and we're a new creation, but we still have the needs of the flesh. That the circumcision of the heart is where we cut that stuff off our life. We deny ourselves and follow Him. Yeah. That's cool. Okay, so I'm going to end with this testimony. Like, I was talking about how I was in that place where I finally gave up everything, right? And then I went through a month of trials where God just spoke, you know, it was weird because he didn't speak to me, but I knew this. It's like, I knew that I knew that I knew this, that God was just, I, I knew that I was going to go through trials for about a month. And at the end of it, I would see his glory because he promised that. So I got tendonitis and just a lot of drama happened. And when you make a commitment to Christ, when you say something, it gets tested by fire. Come on. Like, look at Peter. I'll never leave you, Jesus. <laughs> really? <laughs> Guess what? The devil wants to sip what you just said like wheat. Come on. That's what I believe happened there. But, so, what, you know, what I, I made a commitment. I'm like, God, I'm going to go after you 100%. And it was cool. Like, I mean, I don't. It was lame going through all the fire. Like I got tendonitis, lost my job, I had a tooth infection that was killing me. Um, we're struggling with pills, and then someone, the one of the worst ones was someone told me I was gonna get healed, and me and my wife prayed for seven hours, and the healing didn't break through, so it's kinda like, devil comes in, like, look, you trusted in God, and look what happened. We started going to this uh, Messianic congregation, it was weird. I was scared at first because the little hats and then you know, I'm like, what is this stuff? Charles, keep an eye on the exit just in case you got it. And they start like saying the Hebrew liturgy, which 
It's actually beautiful to me now, but then it was like scary, like, what is going on? <laughs> but I started feeling God's presence there. I was like, wow, I haven't felt God's presence in a while. So we went there and kept going there. The third time we went there, it was funny because I was just sitting down you know, and I was just worshiping, and then I felt God's presence just went full, like just all over me. And then so it's weird because God spoke like really clear. He said, picture yourself in the highest position you could possibly ever imagine yourself in. So I had this picture of training people around nations, and it was just crazy. And like it was just too big for me. It, it wasn't anything that I would ever think of. And God said, Will you give that up for me? Will you deny that for me? I said, Yes, of course. You know, and then it was weird. Because I broke down crying. I'm like, Lord, I surrender my pride. Because pride was what it was, you know. I was I was prideful and it was like that was the root of a lot of it, you know. And it was crazy because right when I surrendered my pride, like this fire filled me. And it was like I it was burning. It wasn't like the, when I talk about fire, like you feel heat, but this was like a burning in my chest. Like someone just lit a flare inside my heart. And I was just like holding my chest, and then all of a sudden the congregation just stands up and prays for Israel and blesses Israel. And so we stood up to go pray for Israel, and all of a sudden I have my first vision where I have angel wings stretched out like 10 feet long, and I'm just like, what? And then all of a sudden it zooms out, and I'm in like seeing myself in third person. I have this golden armor on, I have a sword in my hand, and like my complexion is just like beautiful. I'm like, wow, that's a beautiful guy. <laughs> but so I'm, I'm holding a sword in my hand, and it was crazy because all of a sudden I'm in the, just walking on clouds, and then. I see this demon step toward me. This demon goes like this, and then it goes, falls on the sword. I didn't have to move or swing or know how to wield my sword. I just stood there in his glory, and then God did the work, and I just rested in him. And it was crazy, because after that, like God just said, all confirming the message. Oh, well, wait, let me back up. Then I saw a halo appear over my head, and I saw like my flesh contort. Like, if you guys have seen the mummy where he like, dries people out, but all of a sudden, I see all the fluid get sucked in my body, and then it disintegrates into dust, and I see a body of light. And then after that, I'm just not in tears, like, just trembling, shaking, you know? It was crazy. That's one of the most intense moments of my whole entire life. And it's funny, because uh, I'm constantly looking for another experience like that, because... <laughs> but... Yeah, well, what happened is God said, I'm going to confirm with the message. Then the uh, rabbi started preaching and he started like saying things according to my vision. I was just like, it was out of context, but he mentioned random pieces of my vision. So I'm like, that's crazy. And then the end worship came and I'm just still feeling this fire in my chest and still just not in tears, just getting shaken. And then I hear audibly, I'm the Prince of Peace and I'm with you. And then from that point on, it was over. It's weird because. That whole month of battling cravings and battling stuff, and because like, because I, you know, I dedicate myself to the Lord. So there's temptation there. There's still stuff I have to fight through, and it's like, you know, should I go drink or should I do this or that or you know? And it was crazy. It was all gone. Come on. I, I went to work and I had no nothing. It was just gone. It, it was just crazy. I was just woke up in His presence, and it, it was just completely transformed. It was like being born again again or actually walking in what God did in the first place. But it was crazy. And then from that point on, it just trans it transformed everything. But there's something powerful when we take a stand and we say, God, I'm all in. I'm denying myself. I will I'll pick up my cross and follow you because Jesus didn't stay on the cross. And it's, it's just cool because then, like,